faithful to me. Faithful to me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you're still on the throne. You're still coming. We still believe it. And we just anticipate you're coming to get us, Lord. And we'll give you praise and glory. Lord, if there's any here tonight that's not ready, help them to get ready. And we'll give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're still here and I'm not disappointed because Jesus said, Occupy until I come and I'm going to keep preaching until He comes. But I love the Lord tonight as I know you do. And a lot of people have been wondering, what is all the buzz about Jesus coming? And what does that mean? We're going to get into it a little bit tonight. It's maybe going to be a little bit different. We're going to put on our teaching hat for a little bit and try to teach you a little bit about the Word. And I'm going to cause Angel to really work tonight because I've got a whole page full of scriptures we're going to try to go through. And I appreciate her. I appreciate all these guys. And those of you that are watching this video I appreciate you. I appreciate the guys that put this video together. And wherever this video is going, I pray that it blesses you, that it will touch you, and it will minister to you. And we'll give God praise and glory for it. Amen. 
What is all the buzz about Jesus coming? And what is going to take place? What, what, what is this all about? Where are we going? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to try to break it down a little bit. I didn't write these, didn't give her these scriptures, but I'm going to start with this. In John 14, Jesus said these words. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. How many believe that? He said, if I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. How many believe the word of God tonight? Amen. We're about to go somewhere. And whether you're ready or not, your life is about to take a drastic change that you have never experienced before in your lifetime. If you're ready to go, then we're leaving this planet. And if you're not ready to go, it's going to be a terrible time for those that are left behind. So either way, your life and my life is about to change like it never has before in your lifetime. Think about that. It's going to change. You're going to transfer into a position that you've never been to before. And it's for those of us that are anticipating the coming of the Lord, it's a wonderful experience to feel and to know that Jesus is about to come and receive us and take us out of this dreaded world. As I said before, this is not the society that I grew up in. When I was going to high school, about the only thing we ever had to worry about is getting caught chewing bubble gum. It's true. But now, it's anything and everything. You've got to wonder if the kids are going to come home and say, Mama, I don't know if I'm a boy or a girl. It's got to that point and that place. But we're going to talk about heaven tonight for just a little bit. The who and the what and the where and the when about heaven. It could be days away. It could be merely weeks away. It could be a few months away. But irregardless of when it's going to happen, Jesus said it will happen and I believe that. And it's up to you and I to be ready and be prepared when He comes. Heaven is going to be a glorious place. Heaven is going to be a real place and real people go to this real place called heaven. It is a free gift that God has made a way for us to go to. Think about it. It's going to be a glorious time for those that are looking for Him. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, we'll start with that tonight. But that is, is it written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. You can't even fathom, you can't even comprehend, you can't even imagine in your wildest dreams and imaginations what God has got in store for those who love Him tonight. It's going to be a glorious time, a wonderful time for those who are looking for Jesus to come. Somebody said, well, what is this thing about heaven? How many heavens are there? Well, according to Scripture, there's three heavens. We're going to break it down just a little bit. The first heaven is the clouds just above us where Jesus is going to come to and call us up to receive. Because uh, Paul tells us in Thessalonians chapter 4 that we're going to be caught up together with the dead folks in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is where the stars, the moon, and the planets are. As we can look out on a clear night, we can see the stars and some of the planets, and of course the moon. That is called the second heaven. And the third heaven is where God dwells, where the throne of God is. Hallelujah. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. Paul said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So we know that there's at least three heavens because the Bible says that he was caught up unto the third heaven. Verse 3 says, And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for man to utter. Paul, whether he... Was in the, whether he was having a dream or whether it was a vision or whether he actually went, he was confused. But he said, all I know is it was a glorious place and it was so fantastic that I can't even put into words what it was about. And I'm telling you, we're going to that place very soon if we're ready to meet Jesus. Hallelujah. If that don't excite you, there's something wrong with your exciter tonight. Hallelujah. Whether you believe it or not, we're fixing to go. Those of us that believe, we're going to that place called heaven. Hallelujah. And you know, there's so many people (laughs) that's got so many different opinions and ideas and philosophies about how and what heaven is about. I saw a woman on... YouTube, not long ago, talked about she makes frequent trips to heaven. In one episode, she said, I actually saw cows driving tractors in heaven. (laughs) She said, I saw Jesus put his arm around Santa Claus and take a selfie with her cell phone. You better be careful who you listen to. If it's not in the Word of God, you better leave it alone. Because I doubt very seriously if cows are driving tractors in heaven. (laughs) Glory to God. We talk about heaven, but who actually made the heavens? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Very first Scripture in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we know that God created everything for His glory and for His honor, including heaven. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. Okay, let's talk about where are the heavens. We already said that they were up above us, right? Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I believe if God could make heaven and earth, I believe He's got this. I believe He understands what He's doing. Amen. Next, I want to talk about who owns the heavens. Of course, we know the answer to that, but let's see what the Word of God says about it. Psalm 89 and verse 11. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all of its fullness, you have founded them. So they belong to God. Hallelujah. God has got this. I told somebody one time, I said, you don't have to worry about anything. I said, just think about that you're sitting in the palm of God's hand, leaning back on his thumb. He's got this. He loves you. He cares about everything about you and about what's going on in your life. Psalm 11 verse 4 says, The Lord in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Okay, we realize that God is in heaven, the third heaven, 
That's where his throne is. That's where he dwells. It is a real place. Real people join him in this real place. Okay, let's talk about who was in heaven. God's not there by himself. Wouldn't it be a lonely time if God had heaven all to himself? Of course, we know that the angels are there, but God wants his people, his creation, the ones that he breathed breath into their lives. That's us. He wants us to be there with him. Who was there? Let's talk about that. Let's go to Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How are you, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. So we find out that Lucifer or Satan or our enemy once dwelt in heaven. He was one of God's closest and chosen angels. He was right up there with Michael. He was an archangel. But he got pride in his heart. And he thought, I can be as, as God. I can be the most high. I can get people to worship me. And how many knows that God is a jealous God? He will not share his glory with another. So God cast him out of heaven. And you know what fascinates me more than anything else? I don't know which is more insane. One that got kicked out of heaven or people that follows the one that get, got kicked out of heaven. I mean, come on. People are following this lunatic. You say, well, I'm not serving anybody. If you're not serving God, guess who you're serving? There's only two choices. So we know that Lucifer was in heaven and he got kicked out. How stupid and how ignorant can that be? And we got people following him and are going to follow him right to a devil's hell. All right, let's talk about who will be in heaven. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Don't let pride get into your life. Stay humble. You say, well, how can I get humble? Ask God. Ask God to purify your heart. It wasn't too long ago that I felt a little arrogant spirit coming up in my, my life and I began to pray and I said, God, humble me. I don't want to get exalted. I don't want it to be me because I died. It's all about you, Jesus. And as I began to pray that and began to seek the face of God, as I told you not long ago, the waterworks begin to come and they begin to flow out of my eyes and I can't, sometimes I can't even stop them. And I thank God for the humbleness that he's given me, the humbleness that he's put back in my life that I can be a servant of the Most High God. Matthew 5 and verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So once you're being persecuted for serving Jesus, don't you let that be a discouragement in your life. Don't you let that dampen your spirit. Just understand that they crucified Jesus. They didn't like him, so therefore the world is gonna hate you and I because they don't understand what we stand for. They don't have a clue as to where we're going, but Jesus has got our hands. He's got our best interest in his heart, and he's preparing that place for us tonight and that's what keeps me going somebody said well you get so wrapped up in thinking about the things of heaven that you're no earthly good anymore no Jesus said the great commission he said we got to go and tell them about what Jesus has done and that way they can get ready too 
See, I'm not forgetting about the Great Commission. I try to win somebody to the Lord almost every week, when I, especially when I go to the jail. I try to pour out my heart and let them know that they've got a better plan. God's got a better plan and a purpose for their lives, just like I try to tell all of you when opportunity comes. God loves you. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. Break, wake my brother up back there. He needs to hear this. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. There's going to be many people there. You're not going to be there alone. So if you ever think you're going to get there and become lonesome, don't think that way because there's other people that are going to be there right alongside of us. Amen. All right, let's talk about who's going to be the greatest in heaven. <laughs> Even the disciples begin to ponder that question in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 3. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And said, I sure, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. My, my, my. We're going to be like little children. You ever notice these little children around here? They can be just fighting one another and get angry and start crying. And go to mama and telling on little Johnny or little Susie or whoever and tell them, well, what have they done to me? And five minutes later, they'll be sitting right here arm in arm, loving one another. Jesus said, you got to be like that. Don't hold a grudge against your brother or sister. We've got to love one another. You want to see the Spirit of God move in your midst? Get love and unity. Without those two things, the Spirit of God can ever move in your life. But that's the key right there. If you've got love and if you've got unity, God can bless and honor you. Somebody say amen. amen. Matthew and verse 4, Matthew 18 and verse 4. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child, that is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So you want to be great in the kingdom? Humble yourself as a little child. Don't hold a grudge. Don't think you're any better than anyone else because we're all working for the same Lord trying to get to the same kingdom. Amen. All right, let's talk about who will not be in heaven. We all know somebody that's in heaven tonight. You've got loved ones, friends, and that, just like me, that has gone on and is in heaven with Jesus. I know what it's like when someone goes into the throne room of God because I've been right there. I've held the hand of two people that I know that I feel with all of my heart that was ushered into the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a real place and real people go to this real place called heaven. Who will not be there? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. What a bold statement. Not everybody that calls him Lord is going to make it. Just because you say, yeah, I believe in Jesus that does not guarantee that you're going to make it. The Bible said even the devil, even the devils believed and trembled. Just because you say I believe in Jesus does not seal your name in the book of, book, in the book of life. What does it take to get there? Not everyone who says Lord, Lord shall enter, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's how you get there. By honoring Him, by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and your personal Savior, 
and saying, I'm going to forget, forsake all because this world has not got a hold on me any longer. I'm looking forward to going to this real place that Jesus is preparing for me called heaven. Matthew 16, verses 22 and 23. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angel to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So not everybody is going to be in heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father. All right, let's talk just a few minutes about what is going to be in heaven. You ever thought about that? What's going to be there? First of all, we got to understand that where your heart is, there's where your treasure is going to be. Let's go to Matthew 6, 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. See, we've got to have a different mindset. We've got to have a kingdom mindset. We've got to have the mindset that we're forsaking all and following Jesus. You'll never see When you go to the funeral home, you'll never see a U-Haul trailer hooked up to the hearse. You cannot take the things of this life to the grave with you. Especially if you make it to heaven, you're going to have to forsake it. I was preaching a funeral one time right up here in town. And I heard the awfulest commotion going on that you could ever imagine. There were two, two funerals going on at the same time. And the funeral director came in there to where I was at. And he had, well, right before he came in there, he went into the other room and he told those people, said, you better stop your bickering and your arguing. I'm about to close the casket and put the man in the ground. He got that blunt with him. And he walked in there to where I was at and he said, do you have any idea why they were fighting? I said, no, I have no idea. He said they were arguing and fighting over whether to bury the man with his wristwatch on or not. I thought, my, 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 my. What people will do in this life when it's going to disintegrate, it's going to go back to dust just like the body is. But yet they were arguing over whether to bury the man with his wristwatch on or not. Hmm. Revelation 4 and verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. So as we said earlier, we know that God's throne is going to be in heaven. What else is going to be in heaven? Revelation 5, 13. Somebody said, well, I don't know if animals are going to be in heaven or not. Why would, let me ask you something. Why would animals not be a part of heaven? Why would they not be a part of God's creation when he told Noah, said take two of every animal on the face of the earth and get them in the ark. He cared enough about the animals to save them. God loves animals. He created them. In fact, if you go to Genesis chapter one, you'll understand and read that God created the animals before he created humans. He loves animals. And animals will be in heaven. Revelation 5, 13. And every creature which is in heaven, creatures will be in heaven. And on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And by the way, if you'll go to the book of Revelation you'll find that once we're in heaven and 
the battle of Armageddon gets ready to take place, we're going to be riding white horses behind Jesus coming back to, for him to take his kingdom on this earth. Somebody said, well, I can't ride a horse. Well, guess what? You'll learn to. <laughs> Amen. If you're going to be a part of God's army, you'll learn to ride a horse. Hallelujah. And that horse won't throw you off either. So don't be concerned or worried about that. Hallelujah. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Beginning with verse number 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So we find that there's going to be a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God. Verse 2, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Can you imagine being in heaven and woke up to, if, if maybe, just say for instance, you get a little rash or you get a little cold or something tries to interfere. I don't think it will, but if it were to, all you would have to do is simply go over and pluck a leaf and rub it on you and it would instantly go away. Isn't that amazing? For the healing of the nations. My, my, my. He said there'll be no more crying. There'll be no more death. The funeral homes will be out of business. The hospitals will have to close their doors because there'll be no more death or crying or any pain. Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve, serve him. They shall see his face. Oh, my, my, my. I long to see the face of my Lord. And his name shall be on their foreheads. Verse 5, there shall be no night there. My Lord, don't have to worry about getting flashlight batteries, will we? They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Won't have to get up at 4.30 in the morning and go up there and weld a bush hog together. That'll be done away with. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Glory. All right, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a mo most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she also had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. Somebody said, well, if I can just slip on in. Well, if you can get that far, if you're not right, one of those angels will stop you. Mm. You better be right. All right, she had 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Now if you'll reference that out into miles, you'll find that it's almost 1,500 miles. That's a big city, and that's just part of heaven. 
That's not all of it. That's the new Jerusalem. Oh, hallelujah. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, which in modern terms is about 216 feet thick. Then they complain about the border wall. <laughs> what if it was 216 feet thick and as high as the city itself? According to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Verse 18, the construction of its wall was of jasper. And listen to this. Catch this next part of the verse. The city was pure gold. We heard about the, the streets of gold. Well, I just found a revelation. The whole city is going to be pure gold. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Like clear glass. Pure. 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, some of these I can't pronounce, let alone have I never seen them. But I'm sure they're just precious stones that would we, we would just be beside ourselves to be able to see them. But yet we're going to see them. Amen. Hallelujah. And the twelfth was amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Can you imagine one pearl big enough to cover the gate of that city? And we already said it's 216 feet thick. That's a big pearl, isn't it? Wow. I don't want to see the oyster that produced that one either. <laughs> well, <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 22, but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Amen. Glory to God. Can you imagine that the glory of God is going to be so bright and so imminent that you'll never need the sun again. Amen. Glory. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. And there again he says, there shall be no night there. Won't have to worry about any enemies intruding and infiltrating that wonderful city. Because all of his enemies are going to be cast down into the lake of fire. Hallelujah to God. Glory to God. No more temptations. No more the devil hounding us. The devil trying to get us to turn away from God. And won't that be a glorious day? Hallelujah to God. Verse 26. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it. I want you to get this verse. This is the last verse. Somebody say amen. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only, everybody say but only. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life this is a real place ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters I've been 
serving God for a long time, trying to. Not that I'm anything, but I'm trying to get people's attention to let them know that there is a place called heaven. And real people go to this real place called heaven. And I want you to be ready, hallelujah, when Jesus comes. See, even the devil don't want you to hear that. He's trying to just tear up the televisions. But praise God. If you're going to make heaven your home, you've got to make preparations. Don't just go through the motions of this program. As I've said time after time after time, use the time that you've been allotted here wisely. Use it to help yourself to get closer to God. That's what we're here for. And I can go and I can point to you at least 10, and I'm not exaggerating, 10 individuals or more that would give anything to be right where you're sitting to get a hold of what this, this gospel, this good news, this life-changing event and this life-changing experience. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We might teach you something that may not be exactly the right, but we're going to teach it from the Word of God to the best of our abilities and the best way that we know. You know, I'm not perfect. I may say something wrong. I may teach you something wrong, but it'll not be a false doctrine. It'll come straight from this book. So if you don't like it, you go talk to the author about it. <laughs> Because he's the one that wrote it. But I love every one of you. And I hope we all make it. Whether we go by the way of the grave or he comes to get us all together before we wake up in the morning. Wouldn't it be an awful, awesome thing? No, it wouldn't be awful. It would be awesome for us to, to realize the next time we meet all together, we would be in heaven looking at each other with awe, with amazement, looking and say, hey, we made it. It was real. We did make it. And then look around and see somebody that's been there before us. And I can imagine, Jerry, that Jeff and Dawn and Bertha May and Leon come running up and say, you finally got here. We've been waiting on this glorious occasion. And Jeff Norris, Jerry's brother, look around and say, oh, praise God. They kept it going after I went on home. It didn't die by the wayside but because Jerry took the vision and he ran with it we're all here now and we'll be here forever and forever rejoicing and praising the one that made it all possible and made it worthwhile it's a real place and people are going to this real place and we're going sooner than all of us realize it could be tonight. A lot of people think it would have been even before now. I'm not going to sit up here and give you a date and pre pretend that I know when he's coming. I don't know when he's coming. But I do know that he is coming. And from what I read in the scriptures and compared it to what happened in Noah's day, it's going to be sooner than a lot of people realize. Please be ready. If you're not ready, ask him before you go to sleep tonight, Lord, help me to be ready.
That's one event that I cannot lose, I cannot miss, is when Jesus comes. Let us pray. Father, we love you tonight and we thank you for what you're doing. And Lord, we just say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. You said, behold, I come quickly. Our response is, Lord, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray the convicting spirit of the Holy Ghost, Lord, if there's not one here ready, deal with them before this night is over. And help them, God, to make that clear and decisive choice and decision to say, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. And Father, give them grace in their hearts and we'll bless you and we'll praise you and we are eagerly anticipating the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll give you praise and honor for it. And everybody says, Amen. God bless y'all tonight.